All right, so this is a very exciting panel, particularly because of the keynote this morning, uh, which was very related to mentorship and building communities that educate people to get into this field in some way, whether it's through hardware, software, sysadmin, whatever you want. Uh, there is a QR code down here in the bottom right, and we'll introduce ourselves in just a moment. That QR code behind Kevin's head uh, <laughs> will take you uh, to a link tree that has several links. Uh, several initiatives that we are working on, several things that are just happening in the community, uh, as well as a link to a Discord server where we are home base of the mentorship community that we're all, all a part of, uh, where we just talk about mentorship programs, how to start them, what we're struggling with, with the programs that we run or want to run, uh, what it's like to be a mentor, what it's like to be a mentee, that sort of discussion. We really, this group formed because uh, Emily hosted a uh, panel on mentorship uh, virtually, and we realized, hey, there's really nowhere for everyone talking about mentorship to get together. So we started that place. Um, any other housekeeping? We're gonna go through, we've, we've got some questions, uh, but ultimately we want to hear from y'all. Uh, if you have questions, feel free to raise your hand at any point. Uh, I might stop at some point and also just prompt you to ask a question. Uh, other than that, let's go through introductions. I am Jonathan Starr. I work with NumFocus uh, as the program manager for the Open Source Science Initiative. Uh, we live at the intersection of open source and open science, and we are very interested in starting a mentorship program. NumFocus has 60-some-odd uh, projects under its fiscal sponsor umbrella. And we get a lot of people asking us, hey, how can I make a first commit to some of these projects? Uh, so we want to learn from these folks who are all doing mentorship programs uh, on how we can facilitate that first commit for a lot of people. And now let's just go down the line. Hi, everybody. My name is Kevin Wang, and I'm the founder of the Mentors in Tech program, where we help um, students from smaller, less well-known, but also affordable and accessible college computer science programs um, navigate the hiring landscape and uh, launch their careers in tech. And one of the things um, we do, uh, aside from career mentoring with industry mentors, is help those students who often um, are not able to access industry internships do a um, open source contribution with industry mentors and, um, and, and as a part of their um, learning experience in terms of how to be a software engineer. Um, so they have a path to being a um, software engineer when they graduate. Uh, I'm Tyler Menezes. I uh, run the nonprofit Code Day, um, similar to what Kevin uh, Kevin's organization does. We we partner together on a lot of things. Um, we help students make open source contributions. Uh, we have a really big focus on helping students make their first open source contribution, which might just be a couple lines of code, but um, it helps them get their foot in the door and helps them learn how to solve a problem when no one else knows how to solve it. Um, so, uh, we've had a couple hundred contributions last year. I forget the exact number, but, um, it's been really very cool to see the students continue to make cool stuff. Hi, my name is Emily Lovell and I'm a postdoc in the UC Santa Cruz open source program office. So I work closely with Stephanie Legi, who gave a talk, uh, just a couple talks ago. Um, we are still figuring out what academic OSPOs do, but one part of that that is really <laughs> relevant to um, my interest is working with students. So I also have taught um, college full time at a small liberal arts college in Kentucky called Berea College, uh, where I developed an open source class and learned from a lot of other educators who've been doing that long before me. Um, from there at UCSC, I now work a lot with staff on uh, mentorship programs and working with student groups. So we have a couple mentorship programs. One is called the Open Source Research Experience, and that's really directed by uh, Stephanie. And that uh, we, for that program, we work with uh, matching students with faculty and grad students who are developing open source research projects. Um, and those students over the summer contribute to research projects. I also uh, lead a newer program called the Contributor Catalyst, uh, where we've partnered with one HBCU to start. We'll be growing to several more HBCUs over the next few years to uh, have cohorts of HBCU students come spend time in Santa Cruz and learn together in a cohort model how to contribute to open source. 
Emily's program is wrapping up like next week. So we're really lucky that she came and joined us. For this Thank you. Yeah, I'm actually really sad I missed the keynote this morning because I was on Zoom with my students. But um, but yeah, actually, shout out also to Onexi, who's sitting next to Steph. Onexi was in the pilot program last year. Um, and I'm super excited Onexi came and is giving a talk tomorrow on uh, open source and education and sort of what that could be. So uh, yeah. That's amazing. Actually, who else here has been a mentee? Uh, through an official program or maybe unofficially you've had a mentor in some project at some level got one back there i mean definitely <laughs> uh who's been a mentor same sort of callous officially or unofficially that's awesome uh who runs a mentorship program <laughs> obviously <laughs> uh, is anyone here here because you're interested in starting a mentorship program or having a mentorship program start somewhere where you're at that's awesome. so exciting yeah, thank you for is. coming <laughs> so specifically if we, we've got questions we can start with but i'm curious you know, who just raised your hands what do you want to hear about from folks you just heard their experience with regards to running mentorship programs is there anyone that has like a question at the front of their mind like hey how, how do, how do I do mentor? <laughs> okay, then if something, if we're, we start talking and something comes to mind, just shoot your hand up uh, because what you guys are thinking about doing is what we need more of in this space. Uh, so we wanna help you in any way that we can. And there's a lot of experience and knowledge up here. Uh, okay, so maybe we, we start with that angle, why? Are you all doing mentorship programs in open source when there's so much knowledge already out there? You can go get an undergrad degree in software engineering. You could read a book. You can do a dummies coding for dummies sort of thing. Why mentor? And Emily, you start. <laughs> oh, gosh. Um... I'm trying to pull out the most important things. I think actually the three of us share like a lot of core values in our programs. It was really cool. We were talking about this last night. Um, so I'm sure some of those will come up through this conversation. But I think um, when I started becoming interested in teaching open source, things that um, drew, Rave. <laughs> drew my... <laughs> <laughs> things that we can just leave it off yeah we can just things that we found really um compelling were like it's very motivating for students to get to contribute to like a project that's outside of their academic ecosystem um and it's really difficult and also extremely like profound and rewarding to get to contribute to um a larger code base even if it's two lines of code even if it's fixing the docs um and i think it's also a chance for students to get to engage with um like real developers in the wild in a way that they also don't always get in the classroom. Um, I, so, it, you know, yeah, there's lots of reasons. Impact, having a portfolio of work that other people can look to, developing uh, communication skills that will serve them in the, in the workforce. Um, yeah, open source is suited to a lot of those things. The other thing that I think is really helpful for being a mentor, like why we care about mentorship, um, how many people here are or remember being a student and like you spent like 15 plus years of your life studying for tests and then taking the tests. And if you did a good job, then you get a good grade on the test. And that means you knew the answer to everything. And then at some point you just go into the workforce and you're expected to not know the answer to things and that's okay. And for a lot of students, that's a really big uh, mental leap to make. They haven't really developed any tools to solve a problem when they don't know what to do. And no one has ever told them that this is normal. Um, I've heard from um, like Emily last night, I think was talking about like one of her students who was saying like, it, you know, isn't it, wouldn't it be awkward if, you know, you, you start a job and you don't know what to do. And it's like that this is like totally normal. Like we, we do that every day. So having someone like you, uh, you know, it's someone who knows what they're doing as a mentor, who's able to just help a student feel comfortable with uncertainty and break down a problem and like figure out how to approach a problem when no one knows how to do it, um, is really valuable. And it's not really the sort of thing you can just teach with a textbook. I think our starting point was a little bit different. And I think um, from a different place of pragmatism, um, the schools that we partner with are 
um, small community colleges. So if you're pro if you're not from the area, you usually don't know what those schools are. Uh, but they they have been offering four year computer science degrees for the past um, ten or so years in in Washington State. And those are schools where companies don't come and recruit, even though they serve the type of students that are non-traditional um, in the academic sense. And that tech and including open source said, we want more people that are not like us to be in open source, but nobody ever reaches out to those colleges and uh, colleges. Um, and so one thing that because of that is a lot of students don't get to interact with people in tech and they don't know how tech works. They only see from the outside in. And that's really difficult for them on a couple of things. One is getting jobs. If they don't know how like the whole getting job like process works, it's very hard for them to be successful. I think earlier there was another session about how to get jobs in uh, open source. You know, like how do you present yourself? How do you present yourself being as technically capable, being committed to doing the work and being compatible with an existing software engineering team if you don't ever, if you never interacted with anybody like that. So we ended up building a program that uh, pairs students with industry mentors. We have a whole list of things that they talk over, everything from, you know, LinkedIn to behavioral interview, t technical interview, all of this stuff to help them really understand how the job, you know, how the hiring process in tech works. And then we ended up doing projects. One of the things that, because it's kind of like a catch 22 for these schools is that they don't, because they don't get a lot of industry contact, they don't, their students don't get a lot of industry level um, internships and therefore students aren't exposed to real software engineering um, practices, right? There's only so many senior capstones you can do where you're doing a website for the local dairy farm. Right, that that only pushes your senior computer science level to 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 a certain level. So we ended up working with um, local companies in the Puget Sound area. Some of them were open source projects, and so we started working with faculty to make to to have their to incorporate open source projects into industry and open source projects into their um, into their senior um, capstone projects. So it kind of grew from there for the past few years and 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 it's been really exciting to be um working with open source folks and students seeing that their work are now in you know used by companies that are you know part of the Ma magnificent seven you know that that are and they're going to go interview and they're just going to be much better can much better competitive candidates when they go out did you want to I was going to add one more thing, which is that I think um, another thing that I personally find really compelling about open source that I'm sure many of you can relate to is um, from a research standpoint, I spent a lot of time trying to learn about sense of belonging and how that affects persistence of people who have historically been really marginalized in tech. And I think for me, open source, I don't know, like when I started out in computer science, there were a lot less women. We're doing, we're doing a little better now, but um I think I felt a lot of pressure to always be like the upstanding example of what a woman in computer science is. Like, I think when you're in any sort of minority group, that can happen. And I think for me, finding open source was like, oh, everyone is working together. Nobody knows the answer. Everything is like a little bit of co-learning and figuring things out. Um, and seeing that model, that sort of like, how do we how do we find the answer together? Um, and how I can be a part of something bigger than part of it community that I belong to. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to add, I think that's another important aspect um, that speaks, I think about with mentorship. Yeah, it speaks to, I think, the the philosophy of open source, which, which is something that uh, when we build out, hopefully, a mentorship program and then focus is something we communicate to people. Jared, you were actually speaking about this uh, during the uh, UC Network OSPO talk, the volunteerism in research software in particular. Uh, and getting people excited to contribute to something because they're doing good in the world and their software is being used on Mars to discover and new things and advance society is, is very exciting. Uh, and you don't get that from a book. You get that from contributing to a project and feeling like you're part of a community and all these things. Um, maybe speaking to the number of people here who raised their hands about starting a, uh, a mentorship program, you guys could give us some insights into what it was like to start each one of yours. You all have different types of programs. Uh, and I, I think 
it would be wonderful to hear some of those stories. Oh, she started last time. It's your time. <laughs> or anyone who, who's super excited about it. I think the interesting thing is that even though we start different places in terms of why or where, you know, um, our program started, if you compare all of our programs across, like 80% of it ended up after a few years, ended up being very, very similar. So we, you know, working with students, working with faculty, um, we found a lot of things in common and we built, you know, we ended up building, even though we weren't in communication four years ago, we ended up having very similar learnings and, and therefore, end up, you know, like a, a, some program elements are very, very similar to serve those students. So it's not rocket science, but takes a lot of care, attention to, to do the right thing for, for the right people. I just, uh, I, I think everything Kevin said, absolutely. It's the same way we build software. We don't really know what we're doing and we try our best and then we make a bunch of mistakes and we go back and we fix them later, right? It's the, it's the same thing. I, if you want, you know, I mean, if you want something to get started with, um, look to education. Sure, there's been very, there's been a lot of research on it and there's been a big focus on mentorship for new teachers for decades. So that's a great place to go and look in the research. Uh, you, you know, what do we know that works in mentoring? But yeah, I mean, like, like Kevin said, I think we all built our own version of things and we all sort of converged on the same things because we see like these are the problems that students are facing. And, you know, we try three things to solve them and one of them works really well. And then we all sort of end up doing the same thing. When you're to uh, add a little context here, when you're talking to people who give you the resources to start the program, how you need someone to give you like those resources is there a way that you were able to get that funding that support from administration and, and leadership how to get the money yeah how do you get the money mm. try not to say it but yeah well actually all we we've had some success <laughs> we've all, also because of who our starting points were different we all have different stories about that and and, and i hope that's you know interesting to you guys but you want you can start yeah. Um, well, I was going to go back a little bit to the, the, like, how did you get started? I would say I came very much from the education side of things. So I had been teaching computers. Um, really interested in like supporting intro students. Those were like my favorite classes to teach, thinking about different pathways into computing. Um, I've been doing that for a while, then came to open source. And then from there, I think it just on a personal level, learned a lot that I would rather have a mentoring relationship with a student than like an authority figure that can sometimes happen with teaching classroom relationships. Um, so it really felt like a privilege to move into mentorship. Um, in terms of the, f the funding piece, I mean, well, insane. We've just been iterating. So we've just been also learning as we go. And I think a lot of that has come from asking, really last year I asked the cohort, what do you want to see in the future? And then wrote a grant proposal around that, which led to getting more funding to continue the program. Um, so yeah, I mean, we were we were internally funded initially through our university, through diversity, um, essentially funding and initiatives, and then now have recently secured National Science Foundation funding to grow the program. Um, but a lot of the fuel for that proposal again came directly from feedback from the students in the first year. Yeah, I, I'd also say it's a mix, right? Um, Kevin and I, much to my surprise, uh, to some extent, we also recently got a National Science Foundation funding, which is really cool as a non-university. Uh, um, but uh, we've also been funded by business um, because they see a value, right? They they see the students that are coming out of this program being better prepared than the average student that they would get from some of these programs. And uh, hopefully that will continue to improve. Um, and we're also funded by schools and by governments because they see that, you know, they're, one of their goals is to provide a quality education that leads to good jobs. And um, programs like these mentorship programs, helping students get involved in open source, helping them make contributions. Um, can deliver really great education to those people. And so like, I, it's a mix of all of them, right? I mean, there's there's a lot of different things that people get out of this. I think that's the title of this, right, is what's in it for me. Um, there, there's something in open source for everyone. Um, and it's just about sort of identifying what those values are and communicating that to the stakeholders. Yeah, and I think funders is really, really interesting. Like we have the schools themselves, um, 
find funding to do this because they think it's they know it's incredibly important for their students to figure out how to transition from being a student to a professional and getting that experience mentorship you can imagine a small school that's had a cs program for 10 years don't have a lot a lot of alumni they can draw from or brand uh brand recognition and all of those other things um we also have um cities, local cities and state agencies that fund us because they see that as slightly different lens um, workforce development because they know that having these students in um, community and technical colleges go on to the next step and, and getting those um, higher wage tech jobs will really, really help them you know that's that's what they've been looking for in terms of terms of workforce development so uh, workforce and economic development in terms of city or state level folks and then of course the the usual suspects of of um of um corporate partners and and others in for the reasons that we have but everyone sees this in a slightly different way even though we're kind of getting to the same um same end results so so think broadly about how different organizations may look at mentorship through a slightly different lens and then frame the value prop to them based yeah based on that lens and i think this also speaks to the uc network discussion that just happened before the for the break here what we're trying to do with the discord community with the uh, this getting different mentorship programs on stage is build a network of different people running different programs because each different program has a different value prop but when we work together we can speak a little louder to more people and maybe bring more money into the space to help more programs spin up because there are definitely a lot of programs but nowhere near enough we need more people in open source and we need more programs to help get them there um, and maybe we can speak to that a little bit there's um maybe share some details about your program and then at the same time give a shout out to a program that is not up here on the panel that you all respect as a other mentorship program maybe details like how many people are in your cohort how many months or weeks or years what do you guys sort of think about when you're going through the program as a mentee yeah That's the, the question for anyone who didn't hear is uh, any difference between in-person versus online programs? I can start. Um, so our, I guess I'll speak mostly to our HBC program, um, which is the one that I'm more involved in. Our other program is fully remote and we participate essentially as a Google Summer of Code mentor organization. Um, our HBCU mentorship program called Contributor Catalyst, that one, uh, we, based on initial feedback from our uh, faculty partner at Norfolk State University, and it specifically to be small cohorts of students who spend part of their time in person together. Uh, so we do one week remote on Zoom, four weeks in person on the UC Santa Cruz campus, um, coming and like working in a lab together every day, and then another three weeks remote. And during the in-person part of that program, we do like also just like fun outings. Like we went down and hiked in Big Sur together this year. Um, we went and got hamburgers at In-N-Out. We went to the Computer History Museum in San Jose and all got to like play around with punch cards. Um, so we do some, just a lot of like team building and like getting to know each other during that. And then we also, um, we, we do everything like learning wise. We start with like make a GitHub account, set up a LinkedIn profile, like, you know, your online presence to how do you use Git? How do you figure out what project makes a good project to a healthy community you might want to contribute to? And then by the end, we're contributing to a project. So we're working in the OpenSSF um, project ecosystem this time. And last year, we worked in the P5JS community. Um, and what else was I going to say? Our students get paid a stipend to participate. We cover all their housing costs. Um, their flights, all of that. And I think those are the bullet points. And also my inspiration, Please. yeah, I would say um, Outreachy was like a huge, huge inspiration for me. Like, um, yeah, just really inspired by the work that they've been doing in open source and been following that for a while. I'll tell it as just like a sort of a story. Um, so we started out like I I always loved Google Summer of Code. I never did Google Summer of Code as a student. I always wanted to, um, but I, I ended up dropping out of university and they weren't taking high school students. So um, 
it, that was that was always the place that we wanted to start and like we do and did from the beginning sort of a summer program where we you know we matched a bunch of students virtually with some mentors and we helped them contribute to open source and that was like eight to 12 weeks and what we found was that the students spent most of the time just kind of struggling with the basic stuff like they just they felt awful because they spent three weeks getting the the environment the dev environment set up and they didn't know how to ask a, a good question or like you know they couldn't really isolate down where in the code base a problem was happening they couldn't picture in their head with a new code base how the information was flowing through there were all these problems that were coming up that were just making them make very little progress in this 12-week program so that was sort of where we went to say well what if we did these like micro internships it's four weeks it's 10 hours a week like sort of on top of your school commitment and we basically just say you know you're going to write three lines of code and you're going to spend four weeks doing it and that's going to feel really weird to you because you think that you know you're supposed to write hundreds of lines of code but no we're going to write four lines of code and we'll figure all this out and what we sort of ended up finding was that the students who went through this like struggled a lot and they felt really bad but then they came out of it sort of knowing how to be a developer um, and like actually practice development and not just uh, you know take tests on development and um that's that's sort of how we ended up where we where we are so yeah i mean i think um google summer code is a, is a great program we're just trying to do something like that at a larger scale and to prepare students a little bit better when they're newer for something like that and how big is their program yeah how big um this upcoming year it'll probably be like a couple thousand students hopefully i don't remember the number off the top of my head it, it's been growing Her cohort <laughs> sorry like do they all know each other all thousand people no like how's that break down uh so we have um some partnerships with a bunch of schools in washington state we have um state of california hopefully new york um in partnership with kevin's program um, and then also we just have a public application that that students can fill out and we have some funding to provide spots to those students too so just kind of a mix of a bunch of different things um they definitely don't all know each other we do small groups so like two to three people um, working together on an issue. We don't like one person because it's really helpful if you're new to programming to have one who you can pair program with. And then our mentors also don't know anything about the issue they're being tasked to solve. Um, the mentors are basically there so that the students can say, here's what I think is going on. And the mentors can say, I have no idea either, but here's how I would interpret this. Here's how I would go about figuring this out. Yeah, so um, ours is a little bit different as well. You can imagine that where Emily and Tyler's are and us is on a spectrum, kind of like on a slider bar. Um, ours is, um, we work with about a couple hundred students a year um, during the school year itself. Um, and uh, maybe about half those students participate in open source, either through um, our collaboration with Tyler's program or they're in a senior capstone um, class that we um, we work with and um, yeah, like the whole point, it's like from the student's point of view versus the mentor point of view, it's two completely different things. Um, from the student's point of view, it's their first foray of like an internship, right? They're getting something like all of the things that we mentioned here, like you couldn't get something going on, you know, you couldn't get something installed or whatever. If they were at an in-person internship, they go next door to their manager or an SDE2's office and say, how do you do this? And then they come around, you know things get, get fixed and the, things get going. But with just the, um, the amount of entry level internships that are around now and way, way, way more students in computer science, those, uh, there are just fewer and fewer of those opportunities around. And so from the student point of view is that they get to work on a real project with a real engineer, it's all, we started during the pandemic. I don't know if people remember at the beginning of the pandemic, a lot of um, college internships were canceled the first year. So that's when the colleges started calling us up and it's like, Kevin, can you build us something? Like, what's going on? We don't know. Um, and so we were like, yeah, we can probably build something that can, you know, um, emulate or simulate that experience a little bit. So that's what the students get from that point of view is how software is really built. And it's a surprise to all of them. Like after the first run through, you know, we do student feedback, right? Here's like, well, your program is not good. You know, I enjoyed working with the mentors, but these three things don't work really well. Or, you know, like the onboarding is not perfect because they're comparing to projects, canned projects they had in school. 
And then we're like, these are literally the exact same things we're trying to teach you are those three things that you didn't think worked well, but now you persevere through. And that's what real software engineering is like. And we had to, you know, I think many of them had to realize that the mentors they have are experts in software engineering, but not on the particular problem they're working at. And they don't have the answer keys to whatever there is working on. It's not a school project. So, or sometimes, you know, there was a crazy left turn on the project and you had to go learn linear algebra or revisit linear algebra for an answer, or you dig into the uh, iPhone GPS system that no one thought about. So there's a lot of that stuff that students just don't realize what real software engineering is. And it really harms them when they go look for a job and they don't know those things either. Um, and that's why students that has gone through internships have a huge advantage when they go interview for their first um, full-time job. So we, we try to stack the deck in our students' favor a little bit. Yeah. And, you know, again, this talk is like, what's in it for you? And it is so funny. All three of us last night were sort of like commiserating at the social about like the student feedback that we get, because like, we, you know, the thing that we're trying to teach you is how to work in an uncertain environment and, you know, how to even get your dev environment set up. Sometimes in, in real life, I've worked at a company where I spent like almost a month trying to get my dev environment set up. And then the student feedback is, well, it was difficult to set up the dev environment and the mentor didn't know how to do anything. And it's like, that, this is exactly, you know, what it's like That's in real life. Your first internship and your manager right? yeah like that's literally the thing i have for my manager it's like man this this 40 year old guy doesn't know what's going on right like yeah then, I, I had a friend uh, you know in the early days of like when we were starting up code day because we've been around for 15 years now um and we started as a volunteer thing and a friend of mine like after volunteering with us for a long time like went and got his first internship and i remember like a weekend he's like you know tyler i used to think that we had no idea what we were doing but i guess now i realize that no one does <laughs> like that sort of thing is what you learn but like again you know the students don't think that's what's in it for them right like they think that this is a good resume piece and they think that this is just going to be like any other class and the thing that you take away from it is actually no like all of the things that you've been learning in your class are how to do specific tasks and you haven't learned how to put them all together until you actually try something yeah i would add to that i think like um a, an important component for all of us like has come up is students getting to see this modeled, this like being productively lost thing. And um, I mean, we definitely have like a lot of people kind of like guest mentor, like come in just for an hour or two and like do a Q and A with students who are participating in our program, um, which is very small. I didn't mention that, but our cohorts are like four to six students. So far other end of the spectrum. Um, but I think like one of the coolest things is like, for me is seeing students get to observe developers that they've kind of gotten to know through remote collaboration on GitHub and see them like disagree with one another or see sometimes the students disagree with the decision that's happening in a project and then go advocate for it. And then like to be heard is like so cool. Like we had an issue last year that was like an issue that had been open for years within this community and just sort of like, a super stale people were you know the maintainers were like oh we don't really know that this is a priority and students wouldn't advocated that this was important and like here's a potential solution and like got a pr merged and like that's really cool and then you know this year t they saw people you know sort of disagreeing about sort of markdown style and went and took <laughs> took their own stand on what they thought was important and like they were heard and i think that is something that isn't doesn't always happen in the classroom or even a traditional tech internship. I love the term productively lost. Um, I didn't come up with that, but it's, it's I'm, awesome. I'm definitely going to use that. We, we got a 10 minute warning, so I think maybe we can start taking questions. You had had the question about um, in person versus online. I think Kevin and I, well, Kevin has kind of both. We've done online. Uh, Emily's is in in person. The number one thing I would just say is like it's really easy if you have two to three people working on a team online for one person to do all the work. It's easy in person, but it's easier online. So we've done a lot of work. Uh, we actually published a paper about this uh, a couple weeks ago um, at uh, IDIC, um, just about like AI grading stand up updates to try to identify students who are like not contributing as much. If they're being more vague, like maybe that's a red flag or something like that. So that that's been the biggest difference for. for for me our students before, all the, before we go too far how many questions are there okay short answers 
<laughs> um, ours is a little bit of hybrid. Our students all go to the same set of like eight or nine schools that so they know each other in person. Uh, the mentors are strewn across the country and we have mentors, what was it, Red Hat in Europe and in Holland and stuff like that. That's, we think it's really great because that's the nature of software and, and open source development. So it's important for them to, um, to know that. And also doing code reviews like online and defend kind of where you're coming from and stuff is uh, really great for great experience for the students. Character building. We had a double hand raised back here. <laughs> In my hometown, there's a high school coding club. And I wonder if outreachy would be something for them or anything else. I don't know if outreachy goes down to high. Yeah. So you you do code data. Code data, some high school stuff. Yeah. If you're interested, um, come talk to me after. I'll give you my, my business card. We don't have as much funding for the high school stuff because companies don't want to put money behind it. They, they're just so far out of the talent pipeline. But um, we do some high school stuff. I'll also add, I, so I work with an open source project called the Berkeley Open Infrastructure for Network Computing. And we recently tried to do a high school initiative where we get high schools to contribute computation power to scientific research. And it was so difficult to get people involved. So if you want to get your high school involved in research, there, there's like, we want to do it. I think a lot of high schools and high school clubs want to do it. There's nowhere for us to meet in sort of like a marketplace of who wants to do this and who's doing it. Uh, that might be something that build working with high schools are, are also difficult because you're working with minors and you know like locations so there there's a lot yeah. of legal and programmatic stuff that you need to get out of the way as well or or have settled yeah maybe we try and figure something out after this um i've i've, I've had some experience as a mentor in outreachy and a little tiny bit in google summer of code um but uh, kind of dropped out of it just feeling kind of unprepared as a mentor. And I kind of wonder, are there like trainings for mentors? Like, this is what we're expecting for you to be able to do, or th these are some skills you might need, or like, because it, it, I wanted to provide a good experience for, for the, the mentee, but um, felt kind of lost about it and this is kind of on the total other end of the spectrum of what y'all are talking about but um no this is exactly what we do we realize that for a program to be successful students and mentors need to have a good experience and having good experience means me, means that they understand what it means to be a mentor and a mentee so our mentors take a training with us and they're supported throughout the year. There's, you know, monthly office drop in hours, to, you know, the separate Slack, all of this stuff. It's not just, I think there's an old model. It's like, oh, like mentor meetee, mentee matchmaking. There's like a speed dating event. We even bought some pizzas or donuts and I can't believe the mentorship didn't program didn't last, you know, or, or didn't thrive. Um, so that's the old kind of um, way of thinking, but yeah, having that, having that infrastructure, having the program to support students also take a training, like a two hour training about how the program works, their expectation and stuff like that. Students got a lot of things going on. So sometimes it's like, you know, it, it may, may not be on their, may not be on their party list as, as high, but having that persistence, everything, it kind of builds into what we want them to learn anyway. I think Kevin's is mostly like um, live, uh, but we do have, Kote has some recorded stuff too. If you're just personally curious, I can send you some recorded videos. I will also say in general, like a, a lot of the time mentors are worried about that sort of thing and they feel like they're not providing value. And then, and I hear that all the time. And then the students from that mentor are like, wow, this is like, this completely changed my life. So I think sometimes you undervalue how much help you can, you could be, even if it doesn't feel like that. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. The only thing I'll add is uh, this is such a good question. We are talking about this all the time and trying to get better at it and figuring it out in our own programs. Um, in part, like we're folding in like an alumni mentor component. So I have a student this year who participated last year who's phenomenal and has been like helping to essentially like run the program and can see 
all the sides. Um, so that's one thing that's worked well for us. Um, and then there's also, there is like a mentoring institute at, I can never remember what university, but I'd be happy to follow up with you by email. If you or anyone else in the room is interested, they have so many resources that have helped me that I got through our university's teaching and learning center. Or join the, join the, yeah. Or join yeah, our discord. Exactly Facebook. what yeah. the QR code is for. Kevin, move your head. <laughs> How are we on time? How many questions we got? Beautiful. And and one Thank of the you. things one of the things that chaos doesn't measure in terms of um, health is how many mentor, students come back and become mentors. We're now seeing students coming back as mentors, and that's just um, really fantastic to see. And look, I, I think all, across all three programs, uh, when you have students coming back and wanting to be mentors, you know you've done done well. Join the chaos community and suggest that. Question back here, though. Thanks. Um, I am part of an organization called Tech Fleet that is like a peer um, mentoring experience. Uh, it's actually, it's very cool. It's um, like training people to be on teams, not just to like how to do coding. And right now it doesn't have a mentorship layer, but it's something that, you know, they're thinking about entering, uh, incorporating. And I'm curious, like how open source are all your materials and like, um, how do how do people who are building mentor programs learn from you? That QR code. Yeah, actually, our next meeting. This is a chance to plug our calls. So we have monthly calls. Our next one is on Wednesday. Find information in uh, the Discord or our mailing list. But the top for our next call is going to be output. So it's going to be our group talking about like how do we start to aggregate some of the resources that we're aware of and make them available. Also, gather more information. Yeah. Um, just one quick follow up, which is a lot of the mentoring is really aimed at college students, and that is kind of a diversity issue itself. Um, do you know of mentorship that is more focused on people who have gone through boot camps and that kind of thing? I think like for, uh, I don't know why this stopped working. <laughs> for for Kevin and our program, at least, like we with the CTC students we work with tend to be very non-traditional as far as what you usually see with college students. So I think we would like to see our programs scale out into those sort of things whenever there's funding and bandwidth to do it. Um, I don't know of anything specifically targeted to boot camp students, but uh, yeah. MLH and like GSOC, Google Summer of Code, like those are both open, I think, to everyone. Like you don't have to be a student. So that's content will take people to for our public calls too. So you can you can apply, but it's not like targeted to that. And I'll also so when you said peer to peer mentoring, like is there's no direct mentor to mentee relationship. It's just how to interact with colleagues and I love that. Yeah, so we didn't touch on that, but mentorship doesn't have to be mentor label with mentee label. It can be, the way I was mentored is I joined a community, started contributing, and someone was like, hey, you're doing this a little wrong, you're doing this great, and that felt like a mentorship relationship. It was absolutely wonderful. And fostering that in general in open source, I think is really important. And then uh, to your second point, there are global communities that, um, really try to go to where people are instead of developing programs and develop code with them. Uh, I don't talk about them in these spaces because it's generally frowned upon by the, <laughs> this ecosystem, but uh, it's it's largely in the distributed systems space. And they do pop-ups all around the world, largely where there are no mentorship programs, where are there, there are no traditional hubs of knowledge, that sort of thing. And you can learn a lot from from them even if you might not agree with their technology. Uh, that said. I think we are over time already, so we should wrap it up. Yeah. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> See you in a minute. Yeah, but thank you all so much for questions. If you, we'll all hang out if you'd like to come chat. I know, Jared, we didn't get to your question. Yeah. Also, thanks to John for moderating. Yes. John always volunteers to moderate. <laughs>